Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us today. So I'm going to talk about what can be done with big data and AI, particularly for understanding migration, but also governing migration. Why I call it a mixed blessing is because it comes along with its um, perils as well as its promises. There are a lot of challenges. So today I'm going to try to give you um, a small, small snapshot, uh, snapshot of why and how we use big data and AI for studying migration and mobility at large. So what are the AI tools that I'm going to cover, the big data sources, AI at the borders, and the ethical concerns. I'm going to end up with the data collaboration <clears throat> and a couple of concluding remarks. So uh, regardless of the profession or the area that we are working in, we do hear a lot about the migration and mobility everywhere on the news, on on TV and social media. And we do also know that governments are investing a lot in developing AI tools, particularly and new technologies for everything. And I think it's also very important for the industry and the companies because the, <coughs> the development overall has a lot of impact areas, not on the public and government, but also the industry. But we are also encountered with several critical political, social and ethical related questions about it. So in short, we do know that migration at rise. So international migrant, the number of international migrants is increasing everywhere all around the world in the last 10, 20 years. And particularly in Asia and Europe, we are talking about almost doubling the number. So when we encounter with such a phenomena, we would like to understand it better. And we would like to understand how it's going to evolve in the future. And when I say about Migration, I would like to draw your attention to something. It's a very basic Google search screenshot, as you see. When I type migrant uh, in Belgium, what you do, I mean, not the migrants in Belgium, but when I do the search in Belgium, the Google shows me these photos. As you see, you are seeing a lot of people fleeing, you know, like on the boats or walking to somewhere and mostly Middle Easterns and Africans. But when I look for refugee instead of a migrant, I see more or less the same picture, but can we really assume that migrants and refugees are the same? I'll give you an example. I am a migrant myself, you know, like I was born and raised in Turkey. I lived in Germany, then I moved to Belgium. I lived in the Netherlands, so I moved to Belgium, and then now I moved to the UK. So I'm really traveling for residential purposes. So in fact, what we do see is that the keywords around the migration and migrants in big data makes a lot of difference for the migrant researchers because in fact we are talking about different types of migration you can be a migrant within your country or you can go cross borders but what we need to remember is that the difference between migrants and refugees is about being voluntary movement or a forced movement and so of course we have different types of migrants uh, but we mostly hear a lot about the refugees nowadays because those are the ones that are at right, especially after the Ukrainian, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So in short, why do we need big data and AI? Because the social scientists who are studying migration, they are they really need to get better big, uh, big data processing skills because data is there. But we also need data scientists and computer scientists to have to gain more interdisciplinary skills in social sciences to understand the social phenomena. And we do need data collaborators and data stewards because big data is mostly privately owned, but as well as the skills are mostly in the industry. And there are two challenges. We have the technical challenges and we have the ethical and legal challenges. So we can use the big data and AI for understanding the migration indicators. What I mean is that how many migrants are there in a specific region? What are the flows? Like how many incoming, how many outgoing? So these are the major migration indicators that we use. But of course, it is about how to define the movement of migration or who the migrant is. But there are also several uh, ways of using AI tools related to migration. For instance, AI tools are used to identify, <clears throat> I mean, to check the identity and the origin. We use it for border, at the borders, smart borders and border security. We also use it for automated decision-making mechanisms, for instance, your visa application or asylum applications. But there are also several AI for social good, so for the public good applications, particularly for migrants and the refugees. So the IOM is the UN. International Organization for Migration. So they say that, you know, like the big data is great because we do all know that it is it has high spatial resolution, it's timely, the, it's the high frequency, the, it's not like the survey, so we can really have the global data, it's very rich, it's low cost, and it is not 
collected for specific purposes. It's already there. So there are different types of data that we will touch today. Like I would like to start with the mobile phone data Then we will talk about the geolocated social media data. We have the internet data. We have the IP addresses in general, and we have the earth observation, the satellite data. Both have strengths and challenges. Instead of going in depth in all, I would like to give you a couple of examples. Um, for instance, the internet data for migration and mobility is used, can be used for understanding and predicting migration. So what, what these people, that is Burma and <clears throat> his colleagues, they just use the Google Trends Index to see what people really look for, what do they search in Google, and they selected different words about, about migration, like passports, asylum, uh, assist, <coughs> assistance, and embassy. And then based on those topics, uh, they created an index. And this index, they wanted to use this to improve the existing model. So in this case, we are not talking about going for machine learning to model the migration flows or the stocks. Instead, they used the big data source, the development indicator, to improve the model. And they already show that, you know, like when they use this GTI, the Google Trend Index, they have a better uh, they have a better fitting model. And, and then the second example can be from the social media data. Of course, we do know that there are several studies around Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Reddit, and then so it could really go beyond those. But I'd like to give you two examples, one of them from the Facebook data. And this is a part of our uh, the Hummingbird project. It's the EU funded uh, project <laughs> applications. What we did is our team analyzed the military migration flows between 2018 and 20 on the country level. So we include two, 232 countries. And in addition to that, you see that we use several different data sources. We use the Facebook data for good uh, index two, and then we try to analyze if we use this Facebook data to estimate migration uh, with connection to Spain, if it works as well as official statistics, because we need to do some robustness checks. And we do see that, especially for the colonist countries like the Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, we do see that Spain has very strong connections with those. And, <clears throat> and the, we also could analyze it for the international citizens and the European citizens. So in short, in the cases where we do not have the official statistics or not at the quality that we want, we can use our Facebook data to develop an index for connectivity and the migration flows. Of course, here it is also very important to mention that we need geocoded <coughs> locations. Another example is again from our team is about uh, that we analyze Twitter data to analyze the profile. So we said, can we really see the difference between the migrants and the natives, not only in terms of movement, but also of their connections and the languages and their networks. So what we could find that on the right hand side, you see the core diagram where we could analyze where they go. So we analyze, especially the uh, people in Italy, where they are coming from. And then in the, in the second well, figure in the middle, we do see that we also analyze the tweet locations and the languages. So we do see that, I mean, very basically, migrants uh, use more languages and their code, their codes are way broader than the natives. So but we analyzed more than 200k users, but I have to say that as a starting, we started with more than 200 users that we included their friends, which we ended up with 500 some k and then we added their network. So it was really like, like first expanding, then narrowing down and we ended up from 60 million to 200K because we use only the geocoded tweets. So as you see, you know, we can either analyze or predict the flows, but we can also know more about the migrants, their lifestyles, their networks, the languages that they use. <clears throat> Another data set that we are using is the satellite data. We, you might have heard some use of satellite data for uh, especially humanitarian aid. We do know that in the uh, in disaster areas, it's been used a lot by as a collaboration of the companies and civil society and the researchers. But here, I would like to give you the first example about the internal displacement, because as the part of our project, what we did, we analyzed, we got the familiar case as an example. So we got four years, almost five, five years, because from 2016 to 2020. So we used the EU, I mean, European Space Agency's data satellite from Sentinel-1 and 2 
So we analyze the raw data we process, which takes a lot of time, and then we develop new indicators that we use. And the entire idea was to create this, not very easy to understand graphs, but it, they tell us a, a lot in a sense that we, we knew, well, our aim was to understand if we know more about the environmental change, can we predict the internal displacement? So can we really talk about the impact of this, uh, environmental and climate events. And we found what we find here is that I'm not gonna go into too much detail. The, the pink and yellow ribbons that you see are the raining seasons there. And all the other ones are about this uh, internal displacement rate and the droughts and the, <clears throat> and, and the flood in the first one. In short, we found that when there is a slow onset event like droughts, people take their time to displace. So they try to wait until it becomes unbearable and then they move to another place. So they are really building kind of capabilities to move. But when we look at the graph down and the flood one, we found that when there is a like fast onset, like immediate or an acute uh, climate event, people have to move. So they immediately change places. So in short, we with this approach, we could find that environmental factors is not only about, you know, like the the measuring the basic participation or participation or the temperature we are talking about the reactions of people and we could we could find a way to link it because here we use the satellite data but we also linked it with the internal displacement people this is a wider example and i think it might be more interesting for some of you because it's a commercial product which is developed by the european space agency they call it migration rather to zero because they had the pilot study first so here what we do see is that they said that by using the satellite data and combining with social media data and the official statistics they could do several things and seven of them are they can they can predict the departure points they can predict the traces they can you can use this data for, monitor, for monitoring the external borders. You can monitor the cost and, and the open seas. We can monitor the EU borders and the conflicts and the internal movements. So in fact, it did help uh, to really very in-depth understanding, to develop a very in-depth understanding of the migratory movements in Africa, Middle East and around Europe. Yet, um, there are several questions raised about that because for whom, like who is the customer here? So if we know more about, if we monitor the open sea, for what reason is that? We're gonna discuss it a little bit further. And the final one is the mobile phone data because we, we do know that they have a lot of information and they are usually working with the cold data records, the CDRs. And here is an example from Rwanda. Uh, don't be very surprised because several studies with the mobile phone data happen in the developing countries or where the GDPR applications are easier or the, the legal frameworks are less strict. So here it's for the three years. So they really try to, you know, they really analyze different things to understand, to infer the internal migration in Rwanda. And it did work pretty well. So because they could really use the data based, the, based on the antenna locations, but also they analyze the every single call. But we saw more recent applications of the mobility during the COVID pandemic, and this is from Italy. So here, what they did is they analyzed um, 170,000 unanimously shared positions. And these people are the ones who opted in for sharing their locations. I have to underline Kubik here, it's a company here, but um, that we are collaborating, but they are very open because these uh, Kubik, they are providing um, infrastructure and some services to the telecom operators. So they don't, they are not telecom operators themselves, but they make their data available for um, research and public good initiatives. So AI, at the, so these were the big data sources to understand migration to develop some indicators. But on the other hand, we have more sophisticated tools at the borders. So if you have traveled recently, you would see that it's way easier if you have an European ID with a chip. So you just go to the automatic gate and you know, like with a camera, you can pass along. But it is, it's been used a lot for the identification technologies because you know that 
you know, like a lot of information are linked to each other. So EU smart borders are based on these AI tools, but the AI EU integrated border management is also uh, run by this one. So we are talking about automated biometric systems, but we also have to talk a little bit about the algorithmic profiling. I don't know if any of you have ever been stopped by the police to be asked further questions at the border out of Purdue. So the identification <laughs> technologies is used to identify risky people. So these include terrorists, but also the criminals or people on run or people who are who are not authorized to travel to different countries. So we use fingerprints, we use facial recognition. So automated identification I have been used densely. So, but what might things can go wrong, this is not an example from the borders, but this is a, a study which is based on the pilot parliament's benchmark. So what they wanted to do is they wanted the AI to understand if a person is male or female. So um, it is from 2018 and we they found that this, uh, <laughs> they found that this uh, gender shift project found that the accuracy for white people and male is way better than the people of color. So what if we do not really deal further with this one? So what they did is, you know, like they used the gender classifier from Microsoft, from Face and from IBM. And uh, you see that there are serious gaps between the lighter and darker male and uh, female. So it works better than better for male. And we do all know that there are several reasons which might also lay uh, you know, the travel, uh, the, the, the training data. So <clears throat> the other one is that, okay, so what are we really talking about? Are we talking about managing the migration or migration governance? So a lot of ethical concerns about the use of new technologies for migration is um, around the ethical concerns because we do know that if if we know that these tools have some biases and if we cannot overcome them, can they really serve for more preventive policies, especially um, targeting migrants and ethnic minorities? So the face recognition technologies, we know that there are they are they might be against fundamental rights and there are several risks related to bias, discrimination, but also data protection and mass surveillance. When we consider integrated border management, we do know that all the data is linked and uh, the bias can be extrapolated when transferring the data. But we also use automated biometric systems, not only at the borders, but at several refugee camps and social assistance. Here, there are just two examples, but you know, the refugees have to accept to have their iris scanned it, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to use the support from the UNHCR to buy their foods. And it was also, um, it also happened in Zaatari, and most of the um, discussions were on, yeah, but they gave consent. And I would like to just mention, uh, consider yourself in a position where you have to decline uh, a suggestion for food just because you are worried about your data privacy. So as you see, it's a very tricky thing to discuss. But uh, one of the last points that I would like to make about the AI at the borders is the algorithmic profiling. So this example is a very famous one as well, not from the borders, but um, they just try to calculate the probability of committing another crime just based on the data that they have at the prisons in the states. And as you see here, the, the person on the left-hand side, Jens Rally, is assigned uh, by AI as a low risk and the Robert Cannon uh, as a medium risk with six, because this is, I mean, this mentality is used a lot, especially for this identity check and the uh, risk identification of the migrants or the travelers. However, when you look at the case, the, the background, you do see that Robert has only one petty theft and no subsequent offense, offenses, but uh, the white middle-aged guy has a lot of um, criminal record and the grand theft. So as we see, you know, like the algorithmic profiling might go wrong, especially when we are talking about marginalized groups. And automated decision-making processes, you know, like can really lead us to ignore unintentional or intentionally or prevent fundamental rights to seek asylum because everyone, every human being has a right to seek asylum, to seek for safety. And uh, it also exacerbates the pre-existing vulner vulnerabilities because these people are already vulnerable, but the system biases and the errors and the failures or the data why data privacy uh, violations can really be very detrimental for them. 
So I would like to round up with the ethical concerns. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I have to say that I'm not in a position to blame AI or the tools because we are a biased society. So it's very difficult to consider unbiased tools when human beings are so biased, but at least we have to work in a way that we have to improve the tools and the data. And when we consider this, you, the data, user algorithm, the people who are impacted and the providers, we all have some things to do about it. So the bias in AI is not only an algorithm to be corrected or debugged, but it is also about real life implications on real people where they can have unequal treatment, violation of human rights, as well as their access being prevented, their access to fundamental rights are being prevented. So what can we do? Is there a way? Are we going to leave our jackets and go? No, I think it is very important that we are involved more than ever. And I'm not talking about we, the researchers or academics. I think it's a very complex and large stakeholders network and we really need to build a better ecosystem because data collaboratives help a lot to have better tools and to better indicators and better developed uh, measures. So a data collaboratives, if you have not heard about them before, it's a cooperation between private and public sectors in the field of data sharing and statistics, and they do work a lot. I'll give you a couple of examples, mostly from the mobile phone data, but uh, you do see that there was D4D was a uh, data for development. It, it started in Ivory Coast and in Senegal and Telcom Italia had one, Telefonica in Spain and Latin America did another one, but also, <laughs> but also particularly in the UK, we had the data for refugees with Turk Telecom. And recently with the Hummingbird project that I mentioned that we have, we have another data collaborative where we are trying to use uh, data. So I'm gonna skip this part very quickly because we are running out of time, but data for uh, refugees challenge was to create an anonymous data set to share it with all potential uh, partners from industry as well as um, academia. So we had several projects on safety, health, education, and employment and social integration. So people chose on what they would like to work. Of course, the aim was to help to improve the welfare of the refugees, to provide better insights, help to develop better policies, and seed for other projects. So just a couple of examples of the results. So we developed, I mean, the, the projects, the partners developed social indica in, um, integration indicators for Turkey. They have the access to healthcare or the mobility of the seasonal workers. So as you see, different aspects could be easily uh, followed. And the Hummingbird Turks are collaborative. Now we are working on Turkey again, particularly in Istanbul. We are using call, uh, call data records and XPRs, the internet data. <laughs> So what we do is that what is important, we do not have access to data. We develop the federated learning system, which is also called OPA. So we can run queries on the data, which is already at the company, but we can get the results. And of course, we are working very closely with them. The company is not only a data provider, it's a partner. One example, we developed migrant flow indicators. We also developed stock indicators for Turkey for different cities. To conclude, I think I have two more minutes. Uh, the AI technology is innovative. We need it because the cost and time effectiveness is very, very important for the international uh, migration governance. But it is also important that we help, or let's say we raise awareness about AI and literacy because uh, particularly for the decision makers, regulators, and policy makers, citizen engagement and trust uh, are of great importance here. I should also bring in citizen in a broader aspect. So we we need to trust what's been going on. And of course, there are some pardon, um, questions arise like legal, legal requirements, confidentiality and rules of engagement, but also ethical concerns around the misuse of these new technologies for more conservative and preventive migration policies, which will uh, violate human rights. So what I would suggest is that we need better clearly identified state industry relations because in such cases accountability responsibility and the gdpr compliance compliance are very important factors and the research in general in migration and uh, mobility around big data and ai tools can only be improved through first more investment but more collaboration particularly from multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder perspectives because 
we need to, at least as a social scientist, we need to help the AI researchers, developers, the companies, engineers, to, to be able to see the human beings behind the algorithms and the long-term potential consequences, positive and negative, of these algorithms on real people. Of course, transparency, explainability, interoperability are crucial, and which um, brings us to the importance of the data collaboratives. I do hope that there will be more data collaboratives between the industry and academia, as well as the, uh, the public authorities, because that's the only way to go. So Little PR, our book, Data Science for Migration and Mobility, is coming out in a couple of days. We will have a lunch event in Oxford, if you would be in the UK, or if you'd like to join online. But um, if you're interested, it gives huge um, details on different data sources, visualization applications, as well as the ethical parts. So I would like to thank you a lot. And I would love to hear you have any comments or questions and for any collaboration for afterwards, my contact information is here. Thanks a lot.